blessed good morning to everyone. Could we just bow our hearts in prayer this morning as we go before God? Father in heaven, we thank you, God, this morning. We thank you for, Lord, who you are. For you are an awesome God. You are a mighty God. Lord, and we trust in you, Father. Lord, there is no other like you. We exalt your name on high, God. For you are great, and you are greatly to be praised. Lord, you are the God who guides. You are the God who keeps. And you are the God who provides, Lord, even in the season, even in the storm. Lord, you are there. Lord, your word said that you would be with us always till the very end of age. So, Lord, we trust in you, God. We trust in you, Father. Lord, some may trust in, in chariots and in horses, but we would always trust in the name of God. And Lord, we just worship you, Father. We exalt your name. Lord, we thank you for every aspect, God, of this service. Lord, we present everything into your hands, Lord. Lord, we give you everything, God. Lord, everything belongs to you, God. So, Lord, here, here we are, presenting ourselves as living sacrifices, God. And we say, you be praised. You be glorified, God. You be lifted high, Lord. Lord, we ask, God, that you would just, Lord, hear our cry unto you this morning. Lord, we ask, God, that, Lord, you would accept our worship unto you, that it will be a sweet-smelling savor unto your ear, unto your nostrils, Lord. And a sweet sound unto your ear. Oh God, we just worship you, Father. We thank you for your servants today, God. All of your servants, Lord, as we worship. We thank you even for your man servant, even as he brings your word. Lord, that your word would take root in lives this morning, God. That it would open eyes to see, God. And Lord, that heart would be changed, God. And lives would be touched, Lord. Lord, we believe in you this morning, God. And we put all our hope into you, God. For you are a great God. You are a mighty God. And Lord, we just say, take charge. Let your presence take charge. Let your spirit move this morning. And let your presence fill this place. Fill this place, God. Fill this place, God. And Lord, we just thank you, God. Hallelujah to your name. Hallelujah to your name. For you are a great God. So Lord, we just thank you, God. In Jesus' almighty name we pray. Amen and amen. Good morning again, everyone. We thank you for joining with us this morning on this platform. And we hope that you would have a wonderful worship experience here with us. We just want to leave some, a few reminders this morning of our Bible study on Wednesday at 7 p.m. You can join us there on Zoom and also on YouTube. And we also have or NYI, which is on Fridays at 7 p.m., where you can also join the, us to have fellowship and to learn more about God. And we just also have our, our children's ministry that is on Saturday at 9 a.m., where the little ones can come and learn even about God and who He is and what He does and what He did for us. So we thank you for joining us this morning. We also have our office open and we, we invite those who want to bring their tithes and offerings that they can contact us, contact the office via um, phone number or even email. We would see to it that we assist you in this matter. We also have any requests for, to see pastor or any others, please feel free to contact the office and we would make that appointment for you. So do have a wonderful time this morning as we worship our God. So we invite you to, to stand with us even and worship our God this morning. For he's a good God. He's a mighty God. We want to just offer praise to him. For every praise belongs to our God. So we invite you to just praise God this morning. We invite you to praise God this morning. We say every praise is to our God. Every word of worship is to our God. And we just worship Him this morning. We praise His name. Come on, church. Let's praise His, praise His God. Let's praise His God. And we say every 
Lord, hallelujah, Lord. We worship you, Father. God. Hallelujah. Church, let us pray. Father, we glorify you this morning in the beauty of holiness. We thank you, God, for life. We thank you for the privilege of life, God, that we can come in this place to worship. For all our lives, God, you have been faithful. You have been good to us, Lord. And Father, we worship God. We worship, we worship you, God. We come in humble adoration and praise, bringing all thanksgiving and worship to you, God. For you are worthy. You are worthy. You are Lord God Almighty. Heaven and earth is filled of your majesty. You are God and God alone. And we bless you, God. We thank you, God, for this day you have made it. We continually rejoice, and we are glad in it. And Father, we bless you again. We will just say hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Glory to God in the highest. Father, we thank you for the privilege, oh God where we can gather in congregational worship. For one will put a thousand to flight, but two will put 10,000. And we thank you for the opportunity to worship God. We just say, Father God, all our lives you have been faithful. And your mercies, oh God, they endure forever. They're everlasting, they're everlasting, they're everlasting, and we worship God. Father, I thank you this morning for the elements that have gone in our worship. And as we present your word, O oh God, we pray, O oh God, that as you provided seed for sower and bread for eaters, we pray, O oh God, in the name of Jesus right now, that your word will go forth with authority, it will go forth with healing. It will go forth with deliverance. It will go forth with praise. It will go forth with thanksgiving. Father, we confront every work that opposes the kingdom this morning, God. In the name of Jesus. And we pull it down. We set captivity captive and we loose in the name of Jesus those that are bound. Father, we pray that, oh God, that your light will shine in the darkness this morning. And we know that the darkness cannot comprehend it. That it will break through for us that souls will be saved and that your kingdom come that will be done, Lord, on earth. Oh, we worship, Lord. Father, activate your blood, the blood of Jesus right now, the blood of your son, to make war in the heavenlies. And to save those that are lost today. Father, we glorify you and we give you thanks. In Jesus' almighty name. Hallelujah, somebody. Praise the Lord. Glory to God in the highest. 
I want to say good morning, church. Today is a good day. And you know, we, we just want to thank God for his faithfulness. For all his life, he has been faithful. He has been good to us. And we continue, I want to, as we continue, firstly, I want to bless all of our viewing audience, our members and friends who have joined us, who have been joining in with us for this series. Last week, we spoke about finances and resources. Today, I want to talk about under stewardship in terms of our responsibility for giving. I want to talk about service. And... I have a portion of scripture. Actually, I want to refer principally to two portions of scripture. My main scripture today is taken from the book of Luke. um, Luke 16, and also we will refer to uh, Luke chapter 6 as one to substantiate our... Offering to God this morning in the Word. And I just want to read a few verses from chapter 1. And I'm reading from the NLT. And uh, actually, I want to refer to both the NLT and the King James for this particular study. And the reason being this too, as we spoke last week, is one of the scriptures that is very much misunderstood and many uh, occasions misrepresented. You know, we have a responsibility as stewards in our service to God to rightly divide the word of truth. And that is why the scripture tells us that we ought to study to show ourselves a proof a workman need not be ashamed, but rightly dividing the word of truth. And our lesson today deals principally with two stewards. We want to talk about the master steward in conclusion, and I want to talk about the unjust steward that is presented in Scripture in the, in the book of, of uh, Luke and chapter 16. The Bible teaches, and I want to read from verse 1, just a few verses. And as I said, I'm reading from the uh, New Living Translations, the NLT Bible. And we will refer as well to the scripture in the King James Version. The NLT says, Jesus told the story to his disciples. There was a certain rich man who had a manager handling his affairs. One day a report came that the manager was wasting his employer's money. So the employer called him in and said, What is this I hear about you? Get your report in order because you are going to be fired. The manager thought to himself now, Now what? My boss had fired me. I don't have the strength to dig ditches. I am too proud to beg. Ah, I know how to ensure that I have plenty of friends who will give me a home when I am fired. Verse 5 says, So he invited each person who owed money to his employer to come And to discuss the situation, he asks the first one, how much do you owe me? The man replied, I owe him 800 gallons of olive oil. So the manager told him, take a bill and quickly change it to 400 gallons. And how much do you owe me, my employer? He asked the next man, I owe him 1,000 bushels of wheat, was the reply. Here the manager said, take the bill and change it 
to 800 bushels. And then the rich man had to admire, sorry, the rich man had to admire the dishonest rascal for being so shrewd. And it is true that the children of this world are more shrewd in dealing with the world around them that are the children of the light. And I want to pause there. The children of this world are more shrewd than the children of the light. Now, to understand our teaching today, we must first have an appreciation for some definitions. A steward. A steward is someone who is employed to take charge of a household or an estate, to manage domestic concerns, to manage or supervise other servants, to have the responsibility for the financial affairs of an owner or a company or a rich man or a master, to be have to have the responsibility to manage. And the other word that I want to introduce very, very early as we speak about the steward and stewardship is the whole question of fiduciary duty. Seems like a big word, but it's very relevant to our teaching today. Our fiduciary responsibility as stewards. Many people will say, oh, that is a secular word. And these, those are secular thoughts and secular in terms of knowledge and application. It is not. Uh, when we speak about fiduciary duty or fiduciary, fiduciary responsibility, we speak of an obligation, a legal obligation of one party to act in the best interest of another. So usually it is in the context of a steward who has been entrusted with a responsibility to manage something. That steward, and even when we look at scripture, has a legal binding responsibility to take best care and best represent the party's interest who has entrusted the steward with that responsibility. The fiduciary duty is someone who has been entrusted with that responsibility. In the particular lesson, we see that a rich man or a lord or a master had engaged or employed this, this servant, this manager, to take care of his affairs. The Bible tells us that. It tells us that this man didn't manage well. He was, in terms of his fiduciary responsibility, he was not doing what he was supposed to do. He was not representing the master as he ought to. Stewards have a responsibility to represent. They have a responsibility and an obligation to make first that charge that they have been given. So the scripture says that this man, this, this manager, was held or brought to an account. He was brought before the rich man or the master to give an account for his stewardship. We read in scripture that his response immediately was, listen, because he recognized that, or he recognized that he was going to be fired because of how he did what he was given the responsibility to do. He didn't do it well. He didn't do it well. So the manager or the owner, sorry, had brought him to a place and said, listen, I need to get a final report from you because I am going to fire you. I need to find out what you did. What is the account of your stewardship? The Bible tells us that 
this man, recognizing that the talent he had, or the giftings he had, or the endowments that God had given him were about a particular way he had. He had the ability to negotiate. He was crafty. He was crafty. So he, he didn't have the skills to dig. The Bible says he was too proud to beg. So he decided to engage in a little scheme. Uh, and he called all the debtors of this rich man. And he said, listen. He said, it is better I befriend you and you will take care of me rather than I be fired and I have no means of making a living. I want you to follow this very carefully. This is a serious lesson. This is a very serious lesson. And the Bible says that he started to call those who were indebted to the master or himself as the manager who was accountable, who had responsibility to, to, to take care of the affairs of the master. We have responsibilities as children of God, as church of God, to, uh, to be able to effectively take care of the responsibilities God has entrusted upon us. We have a charge. We have singers, you have a charge when you come to worship God, that you do your best for God, that you bring down heaven. Amen. That may God be glorified because you're doing your best to please God. Fiduciary responsibility. As a preacher, we have the responsibility to study the word of God, to show ourselves and don't misrepresent God's word. Don't add or take away one shot or no tittle to God's word. We have a responsibility not to come here to show ourselves, but we come here to glorify God. Fiduciary responsibility. As musicians, we have to play the best we can play that God, that heaven will open. And souls be saved and, and break through. I remember when the musician David, the young boy, they said that an evil spirit came upon Saul. A spirit of depression. And the Bible says that this young man will go and he will play. He will play. He will play his instrument. And the Bible says that evil spirit will depart from Saul. We have a responsibility as church that when we do whatever we have been entrusted to do, breakthrough will come and change will come and souls will be saved and God will be glorified. The Bible says that this man, recognizing that he, he find himself in a pickle, he find himself in a situation, he said, listen, what will I do? The Bible says he called the people and he made friends with them. Amen. And he discounted the bills. Amen. And the Bible says as he discounted the bills, he gained favor with them. He gained favor with them. Amen. He gained favor with them. Amen. He gained favor with them. Amen. And the Bible tells us also. The Bible tells us that the master recognizing what he did, or the Lord rather, he said he, he admired him. Now, one of the distinctions I want to make very, very early, that in the King James, the Lord is represented by a common letter. So it's not the Lord of hosts. It is not our Lord. This is somebody who owns an estate. This is somebody who has wealth and property and who has engaged someone to manage his affairs. But he said, listen, he admired him because he was so crafty and he was able to bring some kind of resolution to this pickle or the situation he was in. What does the Bible tell us about that? Or what does this lesson teach? One of the principal things that comes out of this lesson is that we will sometimes or in all times, whether on the good side or on the bad side, we will find ourselves in challenging situations. 
we will find ourselves in situations that what we're doing in the normal context or the normal situation, it may fail us. We may find ourselves where we have to come up with new and innovative ways to break through and to get the right results that we seek after. This man was entrepreneurial. He was creative. He was innovative. Amen. So he used the skills he had to get himself out of a situation. God has given all of us gifts. God has given all of us talents. God has given us all kinds of blessings. He has given us material blessings and resources. And this, the fact about it is that we have to use all that God has given us. To get the right results. To represent. To represent. To find the, the appropriate response that we need. He said, listen, he was innovative. You see too, we have to be visionary as well. The, the, I want to say with the other word, the entrepreneur. People say secular. But Christ was very entrepreneurial. And God is because he created the heavens and he created the stars, the moon and the stars. He made all kind of wonder, all kind of scientists trying to understand and comprehend today. They have no clue because of innovation and creativity. He spake and it was done and he command and it came forth. That is who God is. He is the author and finisher of, of, of our faith. He is creator of all. He is God and God alone. When we talk about innovation, when we talk about creativity, we're talking about God for that is who he is. Amen somebody. Amen, amen. God is creator of the universe. God is mighty to save and God is able to deliver us. So this, this man, this unjust short realized, listen, I have to come up with a plan. Amen. What is the plan to find to get myself out of this predicament? Because he's going to be fired. He can't dig. He don't have the strength to dig. He's too proud to, to beg. So he has to come up with a plan. Let me tell you something. You see, when God equip us, he does give us vision. And he's give us goals and objective to go after. Amen. God don't just give us assignment just like that. It is always towards an end. When he gives you a ministry, it's towards an end. When he gives you a gift, it's towards an end. The ultimate end is to glorify God. But we have to find out what resources we have, what tools we have, what gifts we have, what talents we have, who is the network we have to fight for our faith. Another thing we see here is a network. A network. As believers, Sometimes we're too proud to ask people to help us. We're too proud to, to engage other people. But I remember in scripture, the Bible says after in Acts chapter 2, the Bible teaches Apollonia. They did that, that coming together, that brother, Br brotherly communion that they had, that they were in one accord. And the Bible says that, you know, they went forward together, breaking bread together, praying together, eating together, doing everything together. The Bible teaches that as they went together, as they prayed together, as they ministered together, many people, many persons, were thousands of people or persons were added to the church of Christ. Many people were added because they recognized the need for support. You see, he recognized that he needed a network to go forward. He needed something other than himself. And he said, if I befriend these people by just counting their bills, they will show me favor. And when I go to them, they will receive me favorably. We have a responsibility as a church to come together. We have a church to bring people together. We have a responsibility to encourage people to become part of the house of God. That's this lesson. That's what we're talking about. He, he was innovative. 
another thing about this lesson when we talk about the this unjust church we see in scripture that when he found himself in this difficult situation he he didn't quit he started to think what he should do he started to come up with a plan i mentioned that earlier but the thing about it which is very instructive for us as believers is that many times as believers when we reach in a situation that is trying or, or difficult we quit Oh, I'm not able with the church. Me able with them people. Only I doing all the work. Nobody seem to care. Everybody have their own agenda. Everybody have their own mind. But this man had tenacity. This man had enduring and he didn't look at his position or his situation as lost. He saw an opportunity. He came up with a plan. And he had the tenacity to work his plan to get the people to come in so he can organize or orchestrate this plan for his survival. You understand that? He orchestrated a plan in the face of being fired. The boss said, I'm going to fire you because you're a scamp. That's what's going on here. This is his lesson. But the Lord admired him because he didn't resign to the situation. He didn't say, oh, all is lost. But he came up with a scheme to find himself out of the situation. So he exercised a kind of long suffering along with creativity, along with vision to work this plan so he will find himself out of a situation. That's what the scripture is talking about. People say, oh, the unjust man, unjust. That's not what he's talking about. He's just using this to teach very fundamental biblical principles that we ought to have. And I tell you something. In the secular world, when somebody has a vision and they want to establish a business and they're formulating a business, we call it entrepreneurs. And there is something they call, for all entrepreneurs, they call it the entrepreneurial profile. And I believe it resembles a lot of biblical principles that we who are Christians, that this ungodly man showed to us that we must inculcate and make it part of our lives. That is why the scripture is saying that they're more wise, the people of the world, than the children of the light. All the light that we have, sometimes we walk in total darkness and ignorance because of all kind of myth and misrepresentation of God's word. Sometimes it's not our willingness to submit ourselves to prayer. It's not our willingness to walk right and before God counsel. It's not our willingness to humble ourselves before God. Amen. So we remain in a state, uh, not, not, not in the true light of oh God. We're religious. They say the entrepreneur, when he starts a business, he has tenacity. He going long. Days upon days, no money, but he has a vision to, to do something. So he's prepared to go through the pain. He's got prepared to endure hardship so that 
which he is about to achieve or the vision that God had given him, he will achieve it by enduring hardship, foregoing many benefits that if he didn't choose to do that, he could have spent the money, go to restaurants, take the wife out, take a trip around the world. But he decided, listen, there's a greater cause. There's a greater cause. Yes, his stewardship is about a greater cause. Amen. So he said, listen, I will forego those things. And I will work towards the mark of the price. I will work to achieve this vision of mine. That is why Paul, in the book of 1 Corinthians and, and And 15 and verse 58, as he climaxes, as he speaks about the resurrection, and he speaks about all the enduring that we may go through, he said that we ought to be steadfast and unmovable, always abounding in the works of the Lord. So as much as our work in the Lord is not in vain, amen. That is this short, your heart to, to brace it. Uh, your heart to go through it. Uh, but you're not going through it like a baby. You know? You're not going through it complaining and murmuring. Uh, that is why we did in one of our studies, we see that Israel, many of them died in the wilderness uh, when they were crossing through the wilderness uh, because they murmured, you take us out of Egypt uh, to die. You take us out of Egypt, there is no water there. But the, 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 the entrepreneur knows that this is a painful experience, one requiring tenacity and endurance. And he's prepared to do it. Secular people just do that. A lot of them is not motivated. And that is the other part of the lesson I want to talk about. Hey. The rich man admired the man. He says that the principal teaching here also, and I said this to repeat, is that we have to use all, all our possessions. All our guests, our time, sometimes as painful as it may be to be good representatives to God and to show forth in a credible way our fiduciary obligation to God, which is to be faithful to God, which is to love God, which is not to put anything before God. That is another Thing we must consider that God don't want anything before him. I am the Lord thy God, and thou shalt have no other God before me. Sometimes we put everything as Christians before God. We have to see about this. We have to see about that. We have to see about the other. And then after we sort out everything, we bring the crumbs to God. This lesson is about using all that we have our resources to please God. I want to go on a little bit. Amen. Amen, somebody. Somebody say hallelujah this morning. God is good, man. God is good. God is great. You know, God is wonderful. It speaks also, if we go to the script here, is that two things you have to look at in this lesson. The, the, the writer, Jesus is saying also to us and to his disciples, he said you can't love God and money. My mom is money. But I want to expand the, the, the bigger cause or the, the bigger notion in the scripture. Nothing wrong with money, you know. Don't think money is a curse. Money answered all things. And Abraham is the father of the nation. When the Pharisees say Abraham is the father, it's because of Abraham we have a privilege today. Amen. Grafted it to worship God. Abraham was a very rich man. Some scholars believe 
Just as they say Paul was in terms of intellectualism was probably the highest color of his day. Abraham was probably the richest man of his day. So we're not talking about money per se. We're talking about the love of money. We're talking about putting money first and putting your self-interest first before God. You had to love God first. And if you have money, you had to use it too for the kingdom of God. We spoke last week about the, the bands and the bigger bands and storing up bands. But you have to use it. See about your family equity. But you have to use your resources for building the kingdom of God. I want to tell you this as well. If you say you're a Christian and you love God, you have to show your faithfulness in the little things. Whatever it is God gives you to do, Jesus is speaking to them. The lesson or the lesson teaches this as well. He said that you are, if you are faithful in little things, you will be faithful in big things. Your attitude speaks. It doesn't change when you get promotion. It doesn't change when you become a pastor. It doesn't change when you become a leader. It doesn't change when we make you a worship leader. It doesn't change. If you have a lousy attitude, you will transfer that lousy attitude to everything you do unless the Lord converts you, unless the Lord circumcises your heart. That is what we say. Also, if you are dishonest in little things, you're going to be dishonest in great things or big things. The, the parable, you see that in, in Matthew and 25, where Jesus speaks a parable. The, the master is going somewhere to a country place, whatever, and he calls his servants. Matthew 25, I believe it's from verse 14. He calls his servants, and he says to his servants, you know, I'm going and he entrusts them with responsibility. He gave one one talent. He gave one two talents. And he gave one five talents. But the thing I want to talk about, we know this and we have exhausted the scripture. I want to talk about heart condition and attitude towards the work of God. It has to do, firstly, our fiduciary responsibility is to be faithful to all God has entrusted us. But the man who hide the one talent had a bad attitude. He was unfaithful with little thing. He had a bad posture and mindset. And that is why he buried it. And many times God gives us opportunity in the church to work. And sometimes we find it is too low for us. It is degrading for us to do. It is not what we want to do. Or sometimes we have to endure insults and we find it too hard to do it. The master steward. Who is the master steward? Jesus. He epitomizes all that is good. Jesus. Left heaven, understand it. He left eternity, you know. He left a place where he is God with the Father, the Son of the living God. And eternity. And because the Father willed it, he became a steward for our salvation. What do we know about the steward? We know that he honored his fiduciary duty and his responsibility to the father. He was faithful to the father. Yes, he was faithful. And because of his faithfulness, the Bible says that God exalted him highly. He gave him a name above all names. And at his name, every knee will bow, every tongue confess uh, 
that he is Lord. The Bible says that he went to the cross. He was beaten and stricken. He was afflicted. They do him all kind of thing. But because he was on mission and because he was on a vision for God, he was on a vision for our redemption. He was entrepreneurial, you know. It had times when they wanted to kill him. The Bible said he will just disappear from them and they wouldn't know when he will go. But at the appointed time, he came into Jerusalem riding on a donkey, faithful to God, being a son of God, being a master steward for God. He came in obedience to the will of his father, that he who had no sin, that he will become sin, that we may become the righteousness of God. He came in faithfulness. A steward must be faithful. A steward must be true. A steward must be enduring. He came in love because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Amen. Somebody say amen this morning. God is good. Amen, amen. Amen. When I think about Jesus, all that he endured, <laughs> all the condescending, <laughs> They bring him in as a poor boy in a manger. No nothing glorious. No hospital. No special maternity clinic in a manger, the Bible says. Amen. They put him to lie in here. Amen. The Bible says that even in that situation, from a child he was faithful. The angels rejoiced. The heavens rejoiced. The angels rejoice. When he started his ministry, I remember he coming down from the mountain. Faithfulness. Faithfulness. It is not for people to recognize you. But it's for you to be faithful. It is not for, hear what the next lesson says. It is not for people to love you. In Luke chapter 6, which is one of our foundations for this teaching of service. In Luke chapter 6, in verses 27 and 28. It is not for people to love us. But it's that we love people and we love our enemies. It is not that everything in verses 29 and 30, it is not that everything will be nice and hunky-dory, but we must be willing to suffer for Jesus. We must be willing to suffer for eternity. We must be willing to, to, to do the right thing. Verse 31 teaches that whatever we desire good for ourselves uh, and whatever plans we may have for our children and whatever goodness we desire of those who are close for us, uh, we must have the same desire for all men. That's what Jesus did. He came while we were in the gutter, you know. While we were in the abyss, Mary Clay. He came because he first loved, amen. And he had a desire that we have a better life. Verses 32 and 35 teaches that we must pattern our lives. We must pattern our experience. We must pattern our stewardship after Jesus. He's the master steward. They try him in every way. They try him in every way. (laughs) They tempted him in the wilderness. Caesar, Pontius Pilate, Pontius Pilate rather, not Caesar, tempting him to make a defense. Hear him, I have authority. I can lose you. Jesus says that all I have to do is call on my father and he will send legions of angels. You know why he didn't call? Because he understood what it is to submit to the will of God. 
Stewardship is about submitting to the will of God in their life in service. Stewardship in service is about faithfulness. Stewardship in service is about enduring and tenacity. Stewardship is about not quitting when it gets difficult, but finding new and innovative ways to do and to reach the goals that God had ordained in your life to reach. Shortship is not to say I'm a Christian and I can sing. Shortness is not to have a heart for one set of people and not for another. Or one to elevate yourself more than another. Shortship is about faithfulness to God. I want to pray. I want to pray. Let us not be unfaithful in our stewardship, but let us glean from Scripture of this unjust steward what he presented to us in terms of using all that we have for the kingdom of God. Let us pray. I want the musicians to come as well. I want us to sing a song of praise to God as we close. Father in heaven, we give you glory and we give you praise. We bless you, God. Father, I want to be a better steward. I think we all want to be better stewards. We want to be able to exercise our fiduciary responsibility obligation, which is faithfulness and staying with the church above all everything else that we do, bringing anything else into this church. Nothing that we will bring in that will be more important than that duty and that responsibility that you have entrusted us with. We pray, oh God, that you will give us the hearts and the minds. You will give us the spirit, oh God. And the skills, oh God. And the giftings, oh God. And the weary to all, oh God. To suffer love. To love our enemies. That we will not get weary in well-doing. For we know the vision is, the plan is, the purpose is, that in due season, God, we will reap if we faint not. Father, I pray today in the name of Jesus that you sanctify us holy. Sanctify us holy, God, unto the Lord. Father, strengthen us by your spirit, O oh God, that we will have the, the right attitude, O oh God, as faithful servants, as children of God, as children of the light, as stewards who you have called into the vineyard to bring true worship and bring true adoration and bring glory by our stewardship to you, O God. We give you praise. Change hearts today, God. Set your church on fire, God. Set us on fire this morning, O God. Set us on fire, God. And bring us into fellowship, Canonia, this morning in one accordness, one purpose, one vision of man. Bless us, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen and amen.
I just want to thank the church this morning. I want to thank you this morning for joining with us. And last week I had asked if we want shorts to really serve God. And one of the things we, we are asking those who are involved in this ministry to do is to send in testimonies, send it in WhatsApp. You can uh, send it in a text message. You can send it via email or voice note. We want to share with our members and our friends who are laboring in the vineyards. We want to share your testimonies, what God has done in your lives. So we encourage you, you can send it to the office. You can send it to us. We want to share it. And again, I want to mention if there's a need for prayer, and if you want to know more about Jesus, call us. We will answer you. Bless you all. Have a wonderful, wonderful week in, in Jesus' almighty name. And be good stewards. We continue, we continue to journey on this pathway again next week. We want to talk about stewardship in support. What does it mean to be a steward? And to be supportive in ministry. God bless you all. Have a wonderful week. In Jesus' name. Amen. you, God. We worship you, Lord. Lord, we want to be good stewards in your kingdom, God. So we just say, Lord, just thank you for your blessings. So may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. May he turn his face towards you and give you peace.